Welcome to Public Safety Talk Radio, the podcast for all of our heroes in public safety, including law enforcement professionals, firefighters, EMTs, corrections officers, healthcare workers, and more. The show is produced by the POCUA and is founded upon its Soundness Initiative. This episode is also sponsored by the POCUA, a consortium of financial institutions serving law enforcement, as well as other first responders and public safety professionals. Always remember, if you aren't banking with a POCUA credit union, you're just working with an institution that just so happens to serve public safety professionals, and you deserve better. I am Ken Bader, your host for Public Safety Talk Radio, and I am so looking forward to this conversation today. Uh, We have a great guest named Christy Warren, who is a retired fire captain, and I had the distinct pleasure to listen to her show, Firefighter Deconstructed. And they do some amazing things, much like we try to do here on Public Safety Talk Radio, which is really give good advice, good tips, good guidance to all of our first responders and other public safety professionals out there. Um, She is a PTSD survivor, and we'll dig into that a little bit. But she also, speaking of digging, she digs into how the job can affect our mental, emotional health the ensuing physical symptoms, and how to deal with it. And she even tries to help you, even if you just feel crappy. So, Christy, welcome (laughs) to the show. (laughs) Thank you so much for having me. This is awesome. Thank you. Uh, Awesome. Hopefully, you don't feel crappy this morning. No, I feel fantastic this morning. (laughs) I feel great. Good. Hopefully, that won't change after a conversation with me. All right. (laughs) So, let's dig into the main subject because uh, much as you've dealt with, um, some of our audience, unfortunately, has also struggled with, with PTSD. I see that you were diagnosed with PTSD in 2014. Mm-hmm. Um, can you share with, with our first responders out there your journey in recovery? Uh, absolutely. So I, uh, yeah, I was diagnosed in uh, May of 2014. Um, it took me a long time to even get to that point. I think I started uh, showing symptoms in September of the prior year. And then it just finally got to the point where I had, I'm like, there's something wrong. I, I got to do something about this. So I went and uh, saw a therapist and with the attitude of like, oh, okay, something's going on and I just need you to fix me so I can be done with this and get back to work. And, um, and she's like, no, you have PTSD. You need to take some time off of work. And so I put that off and put that off. And I'm like, no, I'm, I can do this. And um, our department didn't have anything at all at the time for uh, PTSD or any mental health or anything. And um, I had worked very hard to portray myself as being very tough and can do the job. And that was the last thing I wanted to ever do was tell anybody that I was struggling. So I took a little bit of time off. I took like five weeks off uh, and that didn't do any good. I was fine, but then I went back to work and I was a mess again. And I mean, I started doing things at work, like I was crying after silly calls. And um, every time the tones went off, my physical response um, just was through the roof. My heart started pounding. Um, It it was kind of like if they called and said, you know, we have a leaking hydrant on, you know, this corner, my body would have the same reaction as, you know, we have an apartment fire with five apartments burning and there's kids inside of all of them. And um, there's something crazy like that. So I finally, um, so I got off uh, October 6th, that morning of October 6th, and what happened is I'd start crying on the way home, and I don't cry, I'm not a crier at all. So I start crying on the way home, and this morning I said, I'm not going to cry, and um, I didn't, so I'm like, I'm good. And then I got home and uh, was headed out to go play tennis, and I got my car and started driving, and then like the world just collapsed in on me. And I was like, I can't do this anymore. I got to, I got to, I got to end this. I can't do it. I'm too ashamed to tell anybody at work about it. I can't go tell them that I'm too, you know, weak to do my job. And so I was, I was looking for a tree to drive into. And I was even like, even if I don't die and if I'm in a coma for a month, I can take a month off of work and I don't have to tell anybody that yeah. this is bothering me. So, uh, so that was in October. Now, I kept seeing uh, my therapist, and then I started doing some EMDR, which is eye movement 
desensitization reprocessing. I can't believe I just said that. That was pretty and good. Yeah, I'm impressed with myself. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm, I'm not. I'm not even going to try to say it. I'm gonna, so whatever, no, she, <laughs> whatever, whatever Christy said, that's what she's talking about. <laughs> so and a, lot, and a lot of people have a lot of success with that, and it wasn't working for me. Um, when we practice on something that had nothing to do with work, it worked great, but work stuff, it didn't do any good. And uh, I just kept continuing to circle a drain and do really horrible and, um, you know, anxiety, uh, nightmares when I was sleeping. Uh, I wasn't sleeping for the most part. Uh, maybe I'd fall asleep for like an hour and then, and then I was up for the rest of the night. Um, I had this like a videotape of really crappy calls that would play in my head over and over and over. And I just, I couldn't get rid of that. So things continued to get bad. And then I found a place called the West Coast Post Trauma Retreat. And um, I had a lot of people telling me I should go. And I'm like, I don't need to go to some rehab place for six days. It's, it's not my deal. So anyways, uh, make a long story short, I finally got there in the beginning of January. And this place saved my life. Um, they taught us, well, they taught us all about PTSD or PTSI. Um, they taught us how it's actually a physiological injury to your brain. Your brain changes shape. It changes the chemicals it produces. Um, so it's not like just some emotional issue like, oh, I can't handle this. It's your, your brain changes. You can see it on scans even. Yeah. Um, and so, so after going to that uh, retreat, um, and, and the, the biggest part of the retreat was having peers there, having a bunch of other big, tough, badasses yeah. going through the same thing that I was going through. And that really made the difference that helped get rid of the shame and make me realize I'm not alone in this. And this is a real issue. And, um, and so when I got done with that, I was doing better, you know, and then I'd go down and I'd go back and then I finally gave in and went on meds. I'd fought that for a long time. Cause that's only for uh, crazy people, <laughs> you know, who can't get their shit together. And, yeah. um, and so, yeah, I went on meds and that changed a lot. I got rid of, um, got rid of that videotape that played over my head. It, uh, it, you know, the nightmares went down. I was able to get some sleep and, um, and it, it, it helped a lot. And that was back in 2015. And I would say the last six months to a year is when I finally feel like I'm doing really well. I get triggered here and there, but I just like, oh yeah, that's just, you know, that's just an Alhambra truck because I had a bad call on Alhambra truck. And instead of me spinning out, it, um, I'm able to manage it now and yeah. sleep so much better. I mean, I still don't sleep great, but you know, I have a nightmare <laughs> here and there, but not yeah. every night, you know, I'm not waking up screaming every night like I was before. And um, so, yeah, finally, so it took, it took a good four years for me to, um, you know, four or five years to really get through this. Yeah. Yeah, I'm I'm glad that that you you're getting the help that you need, and uh, this may seem small, but I'm glad you're getting some sleep. You know, I think that I think that people. I mean, it's not the the whole cure to what it is that you're dealing with, but people sometimes underestimate just the ability to get a series of good night's sleep and how that, you know, helps to regenerate you. Just that alone um, mm -hmm. is, is a plus. Doesn't, like I said, it's not a silver bullet. Um, but, uh, you know, as we were joking before the start of the show, I am not a morning person. <laughs> if I don't, if I don't get, you know, a minimum of six and a half, seven hours of good sleep or like eight or nine hours of okay mm -hmm. sleep, you know, I'm in rough shape all day long, man. <laughs> yeah. You know, when I, when I went and first saw the psychiatrist, she said, um, she says the most important thing we can do for you right now is get you to sleep. Yeah. She says, I don't care if you get addicted to Ambien or something else. We'll work, we'll deal with that later, but you have to get sleep. That's how your brain heals itself. I mean, that's when yeah. your whole body regenerates and heals itself and you're never, ever going to get better if you don't get sleep. And, you know, I still hear so many people you know, that's kind of like the missing link is, yeah. is the sleep. And, um, you know, I started doing this job and working 24 hour shifts when I was 19. And so, you know, one of the things a couple of doctors have said, it's like your, your brain has wired itself to wake up several times in the middle of the night. Right. And that's just kind of how you are. And so I still talk to people who are retired and they say, Oh yeah, I still don't sleep. I still wake up several times, but yeah, you're absolutely right. 
Yeah. Sleep is the number one most important thing you can do for yourself. You know, if you're struggling like this. Yep. And there's your number one tip for the show. Thank you very much. We'll see you next I know. It's great. Uh, All right. <laughs> Take care, everybody. <laughs> it's been a pleasure. Uh, but, you know, it's interesting because I was just a quick side note, and then I want to I wanna learn more about the, uh, the West Coast uh, post-trauma retreat. Um, but I was reading a business book. Uh, and in the book, uh, it was it was um, Choose Yourself by James Altucher, and he shared a conversation that he had with a fellow business professional who had um, lost his business, was close to bankruptcy, had a few other issues, and said he can't sleep through the night. And the first thing mm-hmm. that James, and James isn't a psychologist or, or a doctor or a therapist or anything, but the first thing that he said to him is, all right, you know, go, go to your doctor or go to the pharmacy, whatever, you know, get yourself some pills to sleep. And Mm -hmm. he even said in the book, he says, I I don't do drugs. I don't advocate doing drugs, but for the love of God, you need to get some sleep. You know, if then, and then let's deal with the problem after you've been able to get a couple of good nights sleep. So, you know, there really is something to that. Uh, Absolutely. Now a word from our sponsor, the police officers credit union association. The POCUA can suggest a credit union that serves public safety professionals in practically every state in the country. One state we definitely have covered is California. The police credit union serves all law enforcement personnel and their civilian co-workers, including volunteers within California, employed by any municipal, county, state, or federal agency or special district. They also serve firefighters, EMTs, and court employees in nine counties within the state. The Police Credit Union has proudly been serving first responders since 1953. For more information about the Police Credit Union, go to thepolicecu.org or call 800-222-1391. To find an institution to serve you in any of the other 49 states, go to policecreditunions.com. And always remember, if you aren't banking with a POCUA credit union, you're just working with an institution that just so happens to serve public safety professionals and you deserve better. Let's go to this West coast post trauma retreat uh, because I know you're a volunteer there and Mm -hmm. uh, for some of our audience that, that may be very well needed. So can you tell us about your uh, volunteerism for, for that group and, and dig a little bit more into the retreat if you could. Absolutely. So uh, the retreat was started by a handful of people back in 2001, I believe. Um, a, I think it was a Marin, uh, either sheriff or officer, killed himself, jumped off the Golden Gate Bridge. And, um, and these guys were like, we need to do something about it. And so they started this program up. And um, what it is, is a six-day retreat. Um, there's six clients, so like six people with PTSD. And then there's two clinicians, you know, two therapists that are very well um, knowledgeable in first responders. Um, And, and then there's peers and that's really like the most important part of it. So usually there's like 12 to 14 peers and they are people who've been through the program and have been through exactly what the clients are going through. And so they really help the clients see where you can get and talk, you know, tell their stories of how they got to where they are. And, um, and so you, you deal with all kinds of stuff there. You, like I said, you learn a lot about PTSD and, and what it actually is. Uh, we learn that most of us have the same background. Most of us have had uh, pretty challenging childhoods. And uh, so we talk about our families and our childhoods a lot. Um, we go through debriefing sessions where it's just the six of us and then uh, two clinicians, a couple peers and a, um, a chaplain. And we get like way deeper into, you know, we talk about our critical incidents. Some people end up talking about family stuff and, um, and the, the transformation from the beginning of the week to the end of the week is unbelievably phenomenal. The, yeah. it, I mean, you can physically see a difference in people just, you know, they say that you're only as sick as your secrets and there, that's a place where you, you dump your secrets and, like that. and it, and the weight that comes off of you is just phenomenal. And, and it's, you know, kind of, you know, the police and fire service family and everything they talk about and which many people find not to be true at all. 
um, this place is like a real family that you find and you have so many resources and uh, everybody there is just like I said, very culturally competent. One of the founders of it, he was a San Rafael police officer for like 30 years. Um, and it's a really, uh, it's an incredible place. And they're starting satellite programs around the United States because part of the problem is um, when you call to finally get in, most of us first responders, we don't call for help until we're at the very, very, very bottom yeah. of the well. And they, and there's a waiting list of several months so if people call me and they're struggling, I say the first thing you need to do right now is call this phone number and get on the waiting list. That's because yeah. it's going to be a long time. You don't have to go right now or make a decision to go right now, but you need to get on that waiting list. Yeah. And um, yeah, it saves several people's lives. So I, I go back as a peer. Like I said, they have the peers that are there. Um, and uh, we're just there for the clients. And, you know, we do all the work. We do all the housekeeping. Um, we really focus on taking care of the clients, which most of them have been taking care of people their whole lives and never really been taken care of. Yeah. And so, yeah, so I go back as often as I can, you know, usually it's about four to five times a year. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, it's really, it's extremely rewarding. And then I get a lot out of it. It's really nice to go back and, and be with people who understand, like, I don't have to explain myself, you know, if I start, if I get triggered, or if I start having right. anxiety, you know, or anything like that, or I had a nightmare the night before, I, you just say, man, I'm not feeling good. People know exactly why and how and what to do. And um, it's kind of like being amongst your own people. It's, it's pretty incredible. Yeah. Yeah, no, it sounds incredible. And for for those in the audience that uh, are listening or watching this show because they feel like they need a little help, um, you know, whether it's the, the West Coast post-trauma retreat um, and even if there is a waiting list, there are a number of resources out there. And I think that's what uh, public safety professionals need to understand, whether it's mm -hmm. um, our partner, um, Serve and Protect, that has a 24-7 uh, uh, hotline, whether you're a firefighter, police officer, EMT, nurse, um, they've got folks that have been there that are, are licensed to, to just have a conversation, a private conversation, mm -hmm. um, or going beyond the call or a code nine project. There's, there's a number of them out there. Um, but if you're really struggling and you need to talk to somebody, I, I highly recommend, uh, serve and protect cause they're 24 seven. Uh, but, but great points. Um, you know, I'll, I'll share, I, I, from my own perspective, I'm not a first responder, never have been, um, although I appreciate the work that every first responder does. Um, but just, you know, from my own life, you know, discovered I was an alcoholic and mm -hmm. I'm in a recovery program and, you know, it's, it's helped, it's works and, and I'm very, very blessed with that. But, um, you know, you think, you know, as as a man or a uh, a firefighter or a, an EMT or a police officer, hey, I'm t I just have to deal with this. Yeah. And, you know, you deal with it alone and you think you're fooling so many other mm -hmm. people and you're really not. And what I found you know, from my own experience is is people thought I was a lot stronger when I actually hit my problem head on and, mm -hmm. and doing the work and going to the meetings and so forth. People were a lot uh, more respectful of me being able to do that than when, you know, I was trying to just simply fake it or say, hey, I could take care of it myself. Everybody's like, okay, well, we got to take care of Ken tonight mm -hmm. <laughs> because we know what's going to happen. So, you know, so it's, it's the tougher thing isn't just saying, hey, I'm tough. I'm going to deal with it myself. Yeah, the real toughness, the real strength is is taking the problem and hitting it head on yourself with whatever help it is that you need. That is so true. We say at the retreat, like the hardest thing to do is walk through that front door. Mm -hmm. And um, the, that is the hardest thing for us to do is ask for help. You know, you take a cop or a firefighter or EMT or whatever, and it's like, I would much rather run into a burning building in a heartbeat then go ask for help and yeah. i'm sure a police officers you know the same way or running a hail of bullets it's way easier than you know asking for help and because that's just something we don't do and we've never done our whole lives we really don't even know how to do it and um but yeah it takes so much more strength to say i need help you know making that phone call to work saying you know i'm not coming in tomorrow 
and I got to fill out workers' comp paperwork and tell them why it was, you know, the hardest thing I think I've ever done in my life. And, yeah. Um, but yeah, so you, like you said, it's, it takes so much strength to do that. And like you say, people respect you so much more for it too. Yeah. 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 Agreed. Agreed. Well, you help a lot of people through your podcast, the firefighter deconstructed. Um, tell us how you got involved with the show and how do you go about finding um, your guests and the, and the topics that you pick for the, for the program? Well, I, um, I actually, I wrote a book, still working on it. Um, <laughs> and, you know, to get published these days, they want you to have a, a, you know, like a platform and a big following already. And so, um, and I actually backing up a little bit, I've, I have a friend that I met at WCPR who's got a mm -hmm. podcast. He, um, he was a uh, cop down South and, he he was a narcotics uh, undercover officer for quite a while and got into a big mess and you know ended up losing his job and um having to go through lots of recovery and rehab and losing his family all that kind of stuff so anyway so he started a podcast to help people and he works for a recovery place and um so he kept bugging me to be on his show and i'm like i you know I don't got anything to say and I sound like a tool and I'm not and so finally he kept bugging me and so finally I said, yeah, no, okay, wait, wait, stop you do not sound like a tool let's get well, thank that you. out there okay now continue thank you <laughs> um you know how hard we are on ourselves uh so yeah so I finally said okay so I did the show and I was like well that wasn't too bad and uh and then I kind of thought that's like that was something I could do a little later on I figured out like to help you know, build this author platform and kind of get my name out there. So I did another podcast and then uh, I didn't, I was on the code three podcast and then I did another podcast with a uh, Kristen Walker, who is the CEO of the mental health news radio network. And it's uh -huh. a big net, uh, podcast network uh, from all kinds of mental health podcasts. And so I got on her show and when we were done. She said, will you please do a podcast for us? And at first I was like, yeah, like, like I said before, there's no way I'm going to do a podcast. That's not me. Uh, I'm not. Anyways, I had a million reasons why I wasn't, <laughs> didn't think I should do it. But then I was like, oh my God, like people have been telling you, you should do a podcast. And, yeah. and this here, this podcast opportunity is like falling in my lap. It's like, what are you doing by saying no? So I said, okay, I'll do it. And then, you know, they're really great. They help you set everything up. And, um, and so, yeah, so like I said, I, I don't really feel like I know what I'm doing very much. So I just try, <laughs> I'm trying to get, I just want people to know they're not alone. And so I've tried to get, uh, I, I get a lot of people from WCPR that have become really good friends and I know their story or even people I don't know their story. I will, um, you know, ask them to be on the show. And, and one thing I make really clear is that, you know, anything that they say on the show, if they don't want it, you know, they realize later they don't want it to go out there. Um, I'll edit it out you know, they don't have to talk about anything they don't want to. I just want it to be a really, really safe place where they feel comfortable, yeah. you know, telling their story. And so, you know, I just want people to hear these stories and know that you can get better. Help is out there. You are not the only one at all. And, um, and then I try to have other people on there that will, um, like give advice and ways to, you know, I'll have a, sure. I've, I've had clinicians on, I had a lawyer on who was pretty amazing, who she only represents first responders and uh and, and stuff like that and so uh i i get quite a bit of feedback of people saying you know like i was struggling alone i heard your podcast and listened to a bunch of it and realized yeah. that i need to get help and so i went and got help and so that that just that's worth sounding like a tool or putting myself out there or whatever <laughs> so it's yeah it's been pretty great it's been really really great it takes a lot of work but uh, i'm retired so so that's a good thing. So yeah, I'm a one person show. I do everything yeah. myself and it does take a lot of time. But like I said, it's, it's totally worth it. Yeah. I wouldn't know anything about that. That one person. I know. Show thing. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but as, as one of the cat, I'll get the plug in for podcast magazine as one of the co category directors for podcast magazine, I will say you have a quality show coupled with if your show sucked, we would not be talking right now. Oh, thank you uh, very much. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate that. But uh, but yeah, with with any podcast I cover, whether it's for one of uh, my programs or for the magazine, I listen to a minimum of three or four episodes to kind of get a handle on 
uh, how the show is going and, and so forth. And um, I found your show to be very, very interesting. One of, one of the most interesting aspects that I found is, is you seem to dig into, you know, more than just the obvious. Uh, and I'll mm-hmm. give you an example, because a lot of times you, you think of uh, a first responder or even somebody in the military, PTSD, it's like, okay, they, they got night terrors, they're doing drugs, they're alcoholics, they're, they're beating their spouse, you know, whatever it is. You know, but sometimes it's, it's not that clearly obvious. And I mm-hmm. remember you had, I, I don't remember the guest's name, but I, I believe it was a police officer that uh, had an eating disorder from his PTSD mm-hmm. that, you know, that, that ate so much, well, wound up over 300 pounds and was on all this medication. Mm-hmm. And, you know, people don't say, oh, all I'm doing is eating. You know, there's no crime mm-hmm. in, you know, eating, you know, eight Big Macs in one sitting, which there isn't, but yeah, that in and of itself, <laughs> and he didn't eat big, mm-hmm. eat Big Macs. I'm just tossing it out there as right. an example, guys. <laughs> but, <laughs> hey, McDonald's calling me tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, yeah, McDonald's. I was like, what are you doing? He goes, I like I McDonald's. All right, I just don't want to eat that much of it. Uh, <laughs> but, <laughs> uh, but you know, if you're if you're overeating, if you're eating, you know, every hour, every half hour, you know, you may think that hey, I'm just hungry. Uh, or I have a healthy appetite, but you know, the things that are out of the norm, you know, should be clicking in your head that, you know, Hey, you know, something might not just be right here. Yeah. There's uh, multiple ways of people coping. You know, there's eating, there's drinking, which is a pretty obvious one. Yeah. Um, you know, gambling, mm-hmm. porn on the you know internet, um, f- sleeping with multiple partners. I can't, I can't tell you how many people have had PTSD, and that sounds horrible, but who, you know, cheated on their wife and, and it's only because they're just trying to find something yeah. to take away the pain. And it has nothing to do with the family or any, the wife or anything. It's yeah. they're just desperate to get rid of the pain. And, you know, I, I drank and um, I remember one night it was uh, new year's Eve and I drank myself into oblivion and I had every intentions of doing it. You know, I woke up on the floor and my clothes were all wet and I really, I mean, I knew where I was, but not really. And, um, <laughs> and I'd never been so happy in my life. You know, I felt like crap, but I was so happy because for six hours, like everything turned off and it was yeah. just, I was in heaven. It was one of the best days of my life for a while there. Yeah. And um, so, yeah, so people are just, you know, do anything just to turn that off. Cause it's so painful. Yeah, I I laugh not because I'm laughing at you, but just no, I know. <laughs> but be, but because I've had nights and mornings like that, um, mm-hmm. so I get it. <laughs> yeah. So so I if I remember it correctly, you're in the first season of the firefighter yeah. being constructed. So what does the future hold for the show? You know, give us an insight into to what we can expect in the future. That's a really good question. Um, that's why I asked it. You know, that's they tell me I got to ask questions and, you know, these podcasts. So that's what I do. <laughs> I gotcha. Because I have no idea what's in store. <laughs> I'm like, I get from week to week right now. Um, yeah, I just started in February and um, kind of figuring out, you know, I'm learning a lot. You know, some guests are great and really talk a lot. And then some people, you know, give real short answers and you got to pull stuff out of them. <laughs> And uh, I've never been very good at that. So I'm learning a lot and uh, I don't know what's in the future. I just, I'm trying to, I want to gain an audience and get, you know, as many people out there knowing about it, just, uh, you know, I don't make any money off of it and at all. In fact, it costs me quite a bit of money (laughs) and um, yeah, I just, I don't even know what's in store for it later. I just hope it keeps growing and um, just getting more and more, uh, different people telling their story and more and more, you know, experts and um, that I can get on the show and, you know, talk about yeah. medication and, you know, just kind of everything. So, um, so yeah, I, I really, I don't know what's in store. I just hope it keeps going. I feel like I'm just going, you know, week to week right now. My wife said that if I get to a hundred episodes, she'll come on. So that's my goal right now. You know, a hundred is a very, very good goal. You'd be surprised how many podcasts fizzle out somewhere between mm-hmm. six and 12 episodes. Um, so I often joke in, in some of the shows I've produced around the 12th, 13th, 14th episode. It's like, all right, we're, we're turning the corner. We're, if, we, mm-hmm. we keep, if we can keep on doing this, 
<laughs> yeah, that, yeah, I got 35, so I'm pretty yeah, happy. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly, which is an accomplishment in and of itself. That's, you know, more well, thank than you. that's more than a first season. So, congratulations on that. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm yeah, I'm pretty excited. I'm really excited. <laughs> so, you know, the, probably the most important question then uh, for all of our folks out there is how can they find the firefighter deconstructed out there and either listen to some of the the back shows because you know they're they're very valuable or at the very least begin listening from episode 36 on um so it's on every single platform that you can find podcasts it's uh so, you know, just search for it. Um, I'm on, I have a website called firefighterdeconstructed.com. It's on there. Um, I have a bunch of resources on there and for, you know, phone number, you know, like cop line and save award and all yeah. that other stuff that you were talking about, yeah. you know, resources out there. And um, gosh, I'm on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, all that crap that I really don't <laughs> enjoy, but it's a must. Yeah. So, uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm pretty much everywhere. Um, so yeah, the firefighter deconstructed. And then, like I said, my, uh, my website firefighter, it's not the, it's just firefighter deconstructed.com. Got it. And we will, we will definitely put that in the show notes. Awesome. Thank um, you. And uh, I can attest to the fact that, that Christy and firefighter deconstructed um, is very, very easy to find. Um, go to Google. If you've heard of Google, uh, go to go, <laughs> go to Google, type in the firefighter deconstructed and all the links, the places you could find the podcast, the main website uh, come up very, very easily. It's very easy. Oh, awesome. Find. I haven't uh, even Googled myself for that. I should try it. <laughs> uh, well, if you Google yourself, you're not going to find anything you don't like. So you're good. <laughs> awesome. I think there actually, I think there's like some hooker stripper or something, a porn star named Christy Warren before I Googled it. I'm like, Oh, that's yeah. fantastic. Well, if you're addicted to porn, try to try to pass over that and go yes, directly please. to firefighter deconstruction. Oh yeah, exactly. There you go. <laughs> well, you know, unfortunately Christy Warren isn't necessarily a very unique name. So you might find yeah. some other stuff, but if you type in fight the firefighter deconstructed, <laughs> You will definitely find the show, but, uh, but Christy, thank you so much for being on our show. You were a great guest and, and gave so much great insight today. Thank you so much, Ken, for having me. I really appreciate this a lot. Yeah, very much. Thank you. My pleasure. Great to have you. And thank you to all of you who have either watched or listen to this latest episode of Public Safety Talk Radio, and we will be back with you next week with another great show. Take care. Public Safety Talk Radio is produced by the POCUA. The POCUA is a consortium of financial institutions serving law enforcement as well as other first responders and public safety professionals. To learn more about our association and to find one of our credit unions or service providers near you, go to www.policecreditunions.com. And always remember, if you aren't working with one of our POCUA credit unions, you're just banking with an institution that just so happens to serve first responders. As a public safety professional, you and your family deserve better. Find a POCUA credit union today.